Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. I feel like, hmm, a lot of people who've been traveling during the summer are back, and then I feel like a new batch of people are gone because they didn't travel during the summer, and this is their last weekend to do something before school starts and all that stuff. So then a different group of people are gone. But we're glad we have visitors today here for the first time. Um, and hopefully next week, starting next week, we will be back to our regular schedule where we will have a full house. So welcome, everyone. Today is the first Sunday of September. I cannot believe that summer is gone. Um, and I'm looking forward to winter and to fall and everything. Uh, today is what we call Promotion Sunday. Is it up here? Oh. <clears throat> so we've been announcing that today, the first Sunday of September, we're calling it Promotion Sunday. And annually, what we do is we also do a graduation at the end of the school year and when people are graduating with their cap and gown and stuff. But Promotion Sunday is the official time during the summer. They stay. Like if you are graduating from high school, you still kind of do stuff with the chosen and youth ministry. But officially, starting today is when everybody moves up, right? And as I was preparing for today, I was thinking about this word promotion. And I know this is for church, but I was also thinking thinking that it doesn't always have to do with school, right, or with grades and, and things like that. It could describe other aspects of our lives. For those of you who are working, when you hear the word promotion, you don't think school. What do you think? A promotion in your position at work, and with it comes more money, hopefully, right? Not just a title and more responsibility or authority and power, but money. Promotion means more money. Um, it could be a promotion in some sort of a club or organization or sports league or something that you're involved in. You could be promoted in there. Or it could be here at church. So as I was saying, um, today officially, JAM, which is our preschool ministry, they will be promoted and will now begin to worship and do things with our Hope Kids elementary ministry. And then Hope Kids, the elementary school age, when the uh, fifth graders are being promoted, they will join our youth ministry, which is called Chosen, and they get together Friday nights, as well as we do not have a separate youth worship service like many churches do. So if you look around, you will see sixth graders, seventh graders, really young ones among us because we worship together with youth included. And even we have Hope Kids, who is a youth ministry, when they are seniors in high school, they're graduating into college or that college age. We have Hope Generation, um, that's what it's called, and they go into that. You know, these days, not everyone goes to college. And so you'll notice that we're trying to shy away from saying college group. Because again, a lot of people do gap years. A lot of people opt to not go to college at all. So it's that college age or young adult, young adult ministry. And then you can kind of get promoted out of being a young adult into fully adult. I don't know how and where that happens. When do you stop getting called young adult and be called just adult and then old adult? I don't know. But um, regular adults, the working folks, but you have to be single to be part of ARC. You get promoted from a young adult or college age into working adults. And then you become from ARC to covenant, which is our married ministry and families. And so you get promoted from your single status into married status, and you get to go into covenant. So promotion, not just school, but just in a way of life. I'm not saying one community group or ministry is better than another. Just saying that the definition for our purposes when we say promotion means it's a recognition of an advancement or furtherance of your stage in life. So it's an advancement, recognition of the advancement or furtherance of your stage in life. So you're just kind of getting promoted in your stage of life. Now, some of you may be currently going through a time of transition in your life. And I feel, as Brian was leading uh, the praise of worship this morning, he was saying that, that there's a lot of change he was feeling, and I believe definitely from the Lord speaking, that among us sitting here, some of us or many of us are experiencing some transition, some change in our lives. Whether you've just started a new school, so you know left your elementary school and you started middle school, or you've started a different school, whether you started a new job, or you had to switch locations uh, regarding your job, or whether you started a new relationship, change is happening. Or you might have ended a relationship. So these are big, big life changes. So the question I want to ask you to consider this afternoon is, are you where you should be? 
Are you where you should be? Think about that for a moment. Ponder that. Ask yourselves, am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I where I should be? There are few things more satisfying in life than knowing that you are exactly where you're supposed to be, doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Am I right? There are fewer things more satisfying than to be able to confidently, joyfully say, you know, I am exactly where I'm supposed to be, and I am doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And you've got that joy, that confidence of knowing that you're doing what you were built and made to do, called to do. You're exactly where God has called you to be and, and where you are thriving and being challenged and, and where you are. There's nothing better than that. So let's open our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Turn this on, the clicker. All right, the question is, where should you be? 2 Samuel 11, and later we're going to look in the New Testament as well to Luke chapter 2. So 2 Samuel chapter 11, this chapter contains the very well-known story of King David and Bathsheba. Now, coincidentally, our Thursday morning women's Bible study group, we have an oasis, and it's a bunch of moms with young kids. We get together every week for Bible study, and we just studied Bathsheba. Now, when you think of David, there are two people in the Bible that he's most famously associated with. Most people, even if you're not a Christian, will have heard the name Bathsheba. They will associate David and Bathsheba. Who's the other one? David and Goliath, right? David and Goliath. They're two famous names that kind of everybody knows, Bathsheba and Goliath. And I'm sure you're familiar with this very shameful episode in the life of David. It's a very shameful thing. At this point in his life, David is king. He is on top of the world. He has everything going for him. He's living in a palace. You know, he is the king. He's defeated the Philistines, you know, Goliath and all that. He's defeated the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Amalekites, all the ites. He's defeated all of them. And previously in chapter 8, there's this phrase that gets repeated over and over again in chapter 8. It says, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. So it wasn't just by his own strength and might, but the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. It's obvious that David is highly favored. He is, he's got great favor on his life by God, and he is enjoying the successes that God is giving him. Again, it's not because he's any better in the human sense, but God is on him. He is anointed. God is powerfully blessing him. His grace is upon him, and he has it all. So what happened? So what happened? Let's take a look here. You may read the story on your own sometime. It's, you know, not that long, just chapter 11 here, but I'm just going to summarize it here so that we don't have to kind of read through the whole thing, but you can follow along. So one day, David's men, they're all off fighting. They're on another battle, another conquest, another, you know, battlefield, but David stays behind, and he's relaxing on the rooftop, you know, he's got up from sleeping, it's at night, and he's, you know, probably pacing or walking, relaxing, it's a cool night, on the rooftop of his palace. When he's kind of looking out over his kingdom, he accidentally catches a glimpse of a beautiful woman, and she's naked, she's bathing, accidentally catches the glimpse, beautiful woman bathing. So, he finds out her name, he asks, you know, his workers, finds out her name and who she is. And he has her brought to the palace. You know, you know what happens, rated our movie. He sleeps with her and she becomes pregnant. Now, Bathsheba is a married woman. Her husband is Uriah, one of King David's faithful soldiers. And he's actually currently out fighting, fighting for David. So to hide the fact that she's pregnant with his child, what does David do? David has Uriah return home. This is his scheming, his plan. He has Uriah return home from the battlefield, and he tries to set it up, you know, give them a romantic weekend together, tries to set it up so that Uriah will sleep with his wife, Bathsheba. That way, when people do the math, and they count like, oh, she had her baby, you know, nine months later, and they find out that she's pregnant, no one will question the paternity and who the father is because they'll remember, oh, yeah, Uriah came home that weekend, and, you know, nine months later, you know, she's having a baby. So no one will question it. It may not work today because we've got, what, 
paternity tests, we've got DNA and things like that. But back then, people would be like, oh yeah, and just assume that Uriah is the father. But the plan doesn't work because Uriah refuses to go home. He refuses to sleep with his wife and be comfortable in his own bed. Uriah gets called back off the battlefield, and you know, uh, King David has him to dinner, gives him lots of wine, gets him feeling good, and says, go home, relax, you know, um, be with your wife. But Uriah doesn't go for it. He refuses to be comfortable in his own bed while his fellow soldiers are out on the battlefield in those conditions. He refuses, man of honor. So you know what happens next. David goes from bad to worse. He goes from not only an adulterer to murderer. He sends Uriah back to the battle with a note for the commander. He tells him, he writes a little note, gives it to Uriah and says, take this back to your commander out on the field. And in the note, it's requesting that the commander place him, Uriah, in the fiercest, in the front line, in the place that is most dangerous and most likely to be killed, basically guaranteeing his death. And it's so ironic to me that Uriah is carrying his death note. He's carrying, it's basically a suicide mission. Because he doesn't know, he's not going to open and read what King David has written. So he faithfully, you know, does the king's bidding and takes his note, not knowing that written on the note that he's carrying is his death sentence. So ironic. But at this, this time, the plan actually works. Uriah gets killed in battle, and King David takes Bathsheba as his own wife, and she gives birth to their son. So this plan works. And after a time of mourning, Bathsheba find, she hears the news that her husband Uriah died. Many people did die on the battlefield, so it's nothing too unusual. Uh, hears that her husband did die. And then after she's mourning for a period, and then David sends for her, and he marries her. And she does give birth to their son. How did such a disgraceful and evil thing happen to David, who is the king of Israel, God's anointed and favored one? How did this, this horrible, evil thing happen? I believe that the main contributing factor is found in verse 1. Let's go back to verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 reads, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. What's David doing at home? It's supposed to be a time when kings go off to war, right? It says, at a time when kings go off to war. What's David doing at home? Let's look at verse 11. Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Now the ark of the covenant, where some people believe God dwells and that was a symbol of God's presence, is out there in the battlefield. So even God's out there with the men. Even God is out there with his people while David is relaxing in his palace. If he was out with his men at a time when kings go off to war, if he was out there like he should have been, he couldn't and wouldn't have seen Bathsheba bathing. He wouldn't be on his rooftop relaxing, kicking bag, watching and seeing you know, naked women out there bathing and stuff. He wouldn't and couldn't have seen that. Another contributing factor, I believe, was that he got too comfortable. He got too comfortable. David at this time, if you know the timeline, um, you know, we know so much about David, above and beyond any other person in the Bible. More space and pages and ink is devoted to the life of David than anyone else. Think about it. Who else do we hear about, you know, a young shepherd boy and all his exploits, all his thing with his relationship with Jonathan, his best friend, all the things that he went through with King Saul, and then Bathsheba, the story of Goliath, and then everything about the conquest, and then all his sons, and then he becomes a grandpa. And there is no other person in the Bible that so much is dedicated to, from beginning from when he was really, really young to when he finally dies and all his exploits and his life. So we take seriously, when we look at David, a lot of people, it's really, really good to see. And so David at this time is around 40 years old. And it's been 10 years 
Now, 10 years has passed since he has established Jerusalem as his city. And it's been 10 years since he was officially crowned Israel's king. Everything that happened um, with Saul and everything. So he's been very successful. He's been winning all the battles. And now in his 40s, he's let his guard down. Could it be a midlife crisis? Do people get real comfortable in their 40s? Midlife meaning if we live to about 80 when you're in your 40s, you know, midlife, midlife starts to come in. You know, Hun turned 50 last year, so he's past his midlife crisis, unless he's going to live till 100. Um, but think about it. Those of you guys who are in your 40s now or just turned 40, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? Are you where you want to be in life? Is this where, are you where you thought you would be when you were younger and thinking about, oh, what am I going to be when I grow up? And, and are, you know, are you married? Do you have kids now? Is your life what you thought it would be? So it's been 10 years, like I said, he's in his 40s, and he's let his guard down. He's relaxing. He's taking it easy. He's enjoying the perks of a hard-won, hard-fought kingdom. He's king now. He's enjoying the benefits of his kingdom. You know, he's gotten so comfortable that when a challenge comes, when a temptation comes, he fails. He's gotten too relaxed. It's easy to forget where we're supposed to be when things are going well. And life is comfortable right where you are. It's easy to forget where we are meant to be, where we're supposed to be, where we should be, when where you are becomes really comfortable and it's smooth sailing and, and you know, things are going well for you. So you don't look to see where else I should be. Things are good right here. This is where I should be. And then we may become complacent. We may become lazy. We may become less vigilant about our spiritual health and other things in life. You may become complacent and lazy about other things, whether it be your physical health too or your relationship health, things like that. There's a story of a young man that was hired by a logging company. And we were just recently in Alaska and on this remote island cake, we're gonna do our uh, vision mission presentation next um, Sunday. But on this remote island, what we found out was it's mostly the Clinkett, um Native um, American uh, native people who live there, right? So there's no uh, Caucasian white people, but there's a few. But the few who were there, we were talking to them, they've lived there for now like, you know, 50 years or more. Nobody just moves to that island, okay? So people who are there have been there a long time. And we found out that um, this one lady who we really got close to, Amy and I, she got there because she's actually from British Columbia, from this town called Chilliwack, Chilliwack, um, British Columbia. And she had ended up in Alaska on this remote island because her father was a logger. So there was a lot of logging operations happening and a lot of people from the either lower 48 or from... Uh, from um, British Columbia and Canada would go to these remote islands because they would do a lot of logging and things like that. So this story involves a young man. He was hired by a logging company. He was really strong. He was energetic. He was gung-ho. He's a good worker. And so he could cut more trees than anyone else. You can imagine, just young, robust, you know, uh, person. And there was a much older gentleman who was already working for this logging company who was already there. And this older gentleman would stop, and he would take a break several times throughout the day. The young man, he'd keep cutting, you know, logging and cutting with his chainsaw, all these trees. And he would surpass the old man, the older man, in his productivity. So he was able to produce and do a lot more cutting than this older man. But after several days, the young man's, um, his production, it started to decrease and kept going, kept going. So much so that he eventually got fired because his production had decreased so much. And he couldn't understand how the old man, who, who would stop and rest, could still beat him in terms of output and production. And as he was leaving, cleaning out his locker or whatever, because he got fired, he stops and he asks the old man, he says, when you rested, I continued cutting. I outworked you, and yet you outproduced me. How is that possible? And the old man replied, I wasn't resting. I stopped to sharpen my blade and adjust my chainsaw and oil it. Because you never stop to sharpen your edge, the greater your labor, but the less you accomplished. Because you never stop to sharpen your blade and oil the, 
the um, chainsaw and, and adjust it, the greater your labor, but the less you accomplished. The point here is we have to remain sharp. We have to remain sharp. We can't be dull. We have to take those times to take a step back, recalibrate, readjust, refocus, and think. And then, you know, have the power and have the energy again to get back out there and cut some more uh, trees or logs. We need to take that time. We can't just have that tunnel vision of, you know, work, 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 and just going and living your life and just moving ahead. But you've got to take that time. So it wasn't a wasteful time. This older gentleman stepped back recalibrating, oiling, and readjusting. Wherever we are, we cannot become dull. We cannot become too comfortable. We have to continue to ask this question. Am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I where I'm supposed to be? Wherever you are. Now, personally, I do this. I ask every year on the anniversary of my ordination. I was ordained as a minister, uh, title, Reverend uh, Mimi Kim in Seattle. I was ordained in 2004, and it was 7-11. I remember because, you know, 7-11. 7-11-2004. You get free Slurpees that day, but that's also the day that I celebrate my ordination. 7-11-2004, I was ordained to be uh, a minister, a pastor, Every year on my anniversary, I take time to step back a little bit, spend time in prayer, and I ask God, am I doing what I am supposed to be doing at this time in my life? My thinking and my philosophy and how I look at things might be a little bit different from Pastor Q and other pastors. Some, some people believe that, you know, when you're ordained to be a minister, ordained to be a pastor, you're called for life. That's it. You're, you're going to be a pastor the rest of your life, or at least you should be. And you serve God, you're a pastor, you're a shepherd to his people, and that's it. You don't really question it, right? Unless you have like some huge, you know, scandal, moral failing, and, and you know, get kicked out of your church or something. But um, for me, I don't, I don't think that. I think, yes, I was ordained in 2004, and that is what God had called me to be and called me to do, was to be a pastor, to be a shepherd. But I ask on the anniversary of my ordination every year, is this still what I should be doing? Is this still what, God, you would like me to do? And so it's not that I'm questioning my call. I am firm in that I am, you know, was called to be a pastor. But for my next season in life, I ask God that question. Am I still supposed to be doing this? Because I think that God may tell me, you're done. For, for this many years, you've done, and you've done what I've called you to do, but now this is your second uh, career, or, or why don't you do this or do that? And, and I'm ready to hear that from God. So I will take a step back on my anniversary date, 7-11, uh, 2004, and say, am I still, do you still want me to be a pastor? Do you still want me to be a minister doing this? And ask God. So far, he has said yes. <laughs> he has said yes until now. And then also... At the end of the year, toward the end of the year, when we're already talking about next year, uh, vision planning, um, calendar, setting the church calendar for the next year and things like that, toward the end of every year, I'm, I also take time to ask God, should I, and in the next year, still be at Hope Church? I ask God that too. Um, those of you who really love me and don't want me to ever leave... <laughs> Probably not all of you, but, you know, sorry to say, I do ask that. I ask, God, next year, do you want me to be in Maryland? Do you want me to be one of the pastors at Hope Church, or do you want me somewhere else? I ask. I ask. Again, I don't know that Pastor Q or any other pastor asks that. They're just kind of, you know, this is my calling, and this, and this is what they're doing. But I ask. And I talk to Hoon all the time. As you know, my husband has his own business his handyman service, and, you know, it's doing pretty well. He's got lots of clients, and, you know, if we were to move, because I feel that God called me to a church in Texas, and we were to move there, I mean, what does that mean for his business? What does that mean for my girls who have to start a new school, leave their friends? I mean, it's a major decision. It's not just, oh, God told me, so we're doing it. But I got to talk with my family, my daughters, my mom. She's a widow. You know, my father passed away. She lives here in Maryland, 
am I prepared to leave her so that she lives alone in that big house by herself, you know, and she's elderly and all these health issues. Could I, because God says, go to Texas, this is where you should be, could I go? And again, with Hoon and his business, could he leave it all and then go and try to start it up again? His number one criteria is there has to be a body of water nearby so he could fish. So it's not even about his business. Um, on those you know, few times where I, you know, someone emailed or contacted me about a ministry position, um, there was one in Kentucky that they contacted me about saying, can you move out to Kentucky, to this church, and whatever. And when I told Hoon about it, I was like, should we pray about this? And Hoon's like, where's Kentucky? He looks it up on the map, and he's like, eh, no. He goes, there's no water out there. Like, there's no place to fish, and basically that's his criteria. But seriously, I take the time toward the end of every year to ask, next year, am I supposed to be at Hope Church? Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. So here in the New Testament, Luke chapter 2, I'm actually going to read it through. Did I click it? All right, let's read together. Well, no, not you guys out loud, but follow along. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they, the parents, were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, his parents traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Here in this passage, we see that Jesus' parents, they're pretty upset with him. You know, they find him in the temple courts. They've lost him. They're, he's missing. Think about it. He's been missing for three days. How freaked out would you be if your 12-year-old was lost and missing? And some people read this and think, how could you not notice that your child has been missing? How horrible parents are they? What you have to understand in the background is when they do these pilgrimage, you know, to Jerusalem and, and um, cities, the whole town travels with you. I mean, it's not just, you know, getting on an airplane, you, your husband, and your kids, but it's relatives, the village, your neighbors, everybody's traveling with you. They've got donkeys and carts, and they've got, you know, all animals going with you. They've got, you know, your servants, and it's, it's a village moving, pretty much. And so just like here at Hope church when you guys don't know who's holding your baby because I know I'm holding one of your babies my daughters are holding one of your babies and you're not in the room <laughs> and you're kind of around you know whether you're counting offering or serving somehow someone's got your baby you don't worry because you know that your baby's somewhere in the church someone's got them or her and you're good so you don't look for your baby until it's time to go home and you're like oh who's got my baby oh we got to go home you know it's the same way. So it's not that Joseph and Mary were just horrible, deadbeat parents, but they've got relatives, parents, you know. Is that blasphemy saying that about Mother Mary? But, um, you know, that's what the, there's chaos, people traveling on the road. So they just assume, yeah, and he's probably with the other 12-year-olds. You can't think about Jesus being a kid, right? probably shooting marbles or playing in the dirt with other kids. I don't know. So, you know, he's with the other kids. And the kids are not going to just travel with mom and dad, but they're with their friends, and they're walking together, just the kids, whatever. So that happens. So they, it says, you know, they keep traveling. And then when they finally look for him, they're like, wait a minute, where is he? Well, I thought he was with the other 12-year-olds. I thought he was with Cousin Joe. I thought he was with, you know, and they find out. And they're like, oh, my gosh. And they rush back to Jerusalem. So when they find him, they're pretty upset with him. Let me ask you, if you're looking for a missing Jesus, age 12, age 12, where would you look? Where would you expect to find him? If you're looking for a missing Jesus. When you were younger, 
and you went missing like that, where's the first place that people would think to look for you? When you were younger and you were missing. Now, this is before technology. So there's no GPS tracking and find your friends. There's no, you know, apps or anything. There's no staying at home, Netflix and YouTubing and stuff like that. Usually when you were younger, you were out playing. You were out playing, you know, in the wherever. So think about it. When you were younger, if you went missing like that, where's the first place that your mom would send your older sister out to look for you? or your older brother and be like, hey, so you know, go find your kid brother or something like that. Where would be the first place? What place would they associate with you? Would it be the arcade? Did you ride your bike to the mall? You know, would it be to that park? Would it be to that, you know, think where you would be associated with. Hun's mom would tell me stories about him. Now, if you can imagine my husband Hun when he was younger, you just imagine that for a minute and it makes me laugh all the time. Um, he was such a handful when I was going to marry him. Uh, my mother, future mother-in-law, was telling me all these stories about him. When he was young, he would go missing all the time, all the time. Thankfully, they always found him, but he would go missing all the time. There was one scare where they were on the riverfront, and it was a huge festival. Lots of, it was like, you know how the Han River, there's a festival, it's super crowded, tons of families out there, and one time they did lose him for a couple hours, and they like freaked out, like it was scary. Think about when you, you can't find your kid with the throngs of people there. So they did tell me, you know, that wasn't a joke, that was pretty scary, and they still talk about it to this day. But in other times, he would just be missing. And where they would always find him was, and his mom always knew where he would be. They lived in an apartment, and his mom told me they would always know where he was and they wouldn't worry because he would always be wherever they were doing construction, where they were repaving the asphalt, they were putting down tar and things like that. And then, you know, he would be there doing his little squat like this, watching, fascinated, you know, watching them repave and, and stuff. And he would come in the house covered in black tar soot, you know, like ash and the black that comes off of you, he would come, his face would be all black and just his hands and everything. And he would just have this goofy smile and she told me he'd come home. And so wherever, if he's missing and he's not home for dinner, she would just go, you know, look out the window, look for where construction was happening, where some project was happening, and there you would find him fascinated watching. You know, and that was his call. He's you know, a great handyman now. But so people, his mom knew where he would be and where he was associated with. Now, this is the only story that we have of Jesus as a kid, as a teenager. Think about that. We don't have lots of great stories about what Jesus is doing, hanging out with his friends, what he's doing, how his parents discipline him, if he needed discipline at all. We only get this very brief glimpse of Jesus' young life here in the book of Luke. In verse 49, Jesus is genuinely surprised. He's genuinely surprised that his parents had to search for him at all because his parents, you know, and his answer is very, very matter of fact. He's like, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? He's like, huh? Why, why are you searching everywhere? Why are you freaking out? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Now, for us parents, if your 12-year-old talks to you like that, you know, you'd be like, are you getting smart with me? <laughs> you know, but this is Jesus saying to his parents, this, I'm at my father's house. What can you say to that, right? He's saying, where else should I be? As children of God, how matter of fact is it for you to be here in your father's house on Sundays? How matter of fact is it for you to be here worshiping with the community and with the body of Christ on Sundays? When I was in high school, I was pretty active and involved in my youth group. You know, most of you know, Pastor Q was my youth pastor, so of course, you know, he ran a tight ship. But, um, you know, I was pretty involved and very active in my youth group. I was one of the officers and my friends. And, you know, every Friday night, we would come to church. We had a Friday night prayer meeting. Those prayer meetings were intense, but we loved it. Friday night prayer meeting every Friday at the church. So at school, my friends were mostly non-Christian. I also did not hang around with other Asians. Um, I'm sure you'd be really surprised to know, but most of my friends were, were not Asian, and, and they were not Christian. And my friends would do stuff on Friday nights. You know, they would have parties or get-togethers or, or things that happen. And then I would hear about it at school on Monday morning, you know. And 
there was no social media back then. There was no smartphones. There was no, um, what do you call, real-time posting selfies and, and live streaming of events. So this whole thing of FOMO, you know, fear of missing out, you didn't know you were missing anything until Monday morning. You know, now you know you're missing. You're like, oh man, I should be there right now. They didn't invite me to this. You know, and you know who's where and who's hanging out with who and you're missing out. You didn't get the invite. But back then, you didn't hear about it until Monday morning when your friends started talking about it. And you're like, I wasn't invited, right? And so I would be hurt. I'd be hurt Monday morning. And I'd be like, oh man, they didn't tell me, you know, they didn't invite me. So when I finally said something to my friends, their response caught me off guard. Their response was, they said, they're like, Mimi, we know you always go to church on Friday nights. We assume that, and we don't even bother to ask you because you're going to say no. That's what they said to me. All my friends knew that on Friday nights, they could find me in my father's house. That's where I was going to be. They respected that, and they didn't even bother to ask me. because They knew I was, I was going to say no. Oh, I got to go to church. So back to the question, are you where you should be? Should you be out overseas on missions? Did you commit or say yes to God um, earlier in life? And for whatever reason, you haven't been able to commit to that or you haven't been able to do or be where you're supposed to be. Should you be working where you are? Think about where you're working. Should you be working where you are? Should you be living where you are? Howard County, Montgomery County, inner city, suburbs, urban, suburban, whatever city or town. Are you living with your parents? Are you living with a roommate? Are you living with your boyfriend, girlfriend? Should you be living where you are? Should you be going back to school for another degree, continuing education? These are big life decisions. Should you go back? Should you learn something else? Should you be in the relationship that you are in? Is that where you're supposed to be? in that relationship with so-and-so? Should you be an elder or deacon serving here at Hope Church? Is that what you're supposed to be doing, serving actively and have become an elder or deacon? Wherever it is you should be, you need to stay sharp and you need to be alert and never get too comfortable. Never be afraid to ask, am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Wherever you're supposed to be, be fully there and make it count. Be fully there. If you are where you're supposed to be, relish it. It may not always be that that's where you're going to be. It may not be that I'm always going to be a pastor. It may not be that I'm always going to be at Hope Church. So while I'm here, while I'm doing what God has, uh, wants me to be doing, where I'm supposed to be doing it, I need to thrive. I need to relish, enjoy. I need to be challenged and love it and just grow in it. Make it count. As I said in the beginning, there are few things more satisfying than knowing that you're exactly where you're supposed to be, doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. That is my challenge to you today. And today is the very um, first Sunday of the month. And yes, all of you sitting here are exactly where you should be. And we are going to do exactly what we're supposed to be doing, which is communion. We're reminded as a commandment from our Lord Jesus and as Paul has written that we are to regularly come together as a body of Christ to break bread together and to do this in remembrance of him. So if I could have the um, ushers come. And let's just prepare our hearts as we're thinking about, as you're sitting there, Am I where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Consider that as we participate in communion today.